Hi, my name is Leslie Travers. I am a set and costume designer. I live just up the road from this amazing art space. I live in a place called Torhead on the North Antrim coast overlooking the sea. Um, as I said, I'm a set and costume designer. I work in opera and theatre. I work here, I work internationally, and uh, I want to talk to you about one specific production that means a lot to me. Is my first production at Teatro alla Scala in Milan. In some ways, I think of it as the home of opera. Well, I did when I was a young kid growing up in Hartlepool in the northeast where I'm from originally and looking in library books about opera and in illustrations in those old fashioned illustrations there were images of that incredible red and gold auditorium. I go forward in time a little bit to the age of 18 and after finishing school I made a trip down to Italy to go to that Italian city. I probably picked the worst month possible. I was there in August when Milan, when Italy is shot but I got off that train in that searing sunlight and walked to the square where La Scala is and just walked up to the building and touched its sun-drenched walls and dreamt one day about working there. Then I go forward in time to the age of 21 when I graduated from the Wimbledon School of Art um, and did a where I'd done a degree in theatre design. And then I started my career in the industry working in theatre and eventually starting work in opera. And then my opera work became international. Then I go forward in time again, and then I started working with a director who I have always admired, a director called David Pountney. Back in 2017, he called me when I was on a train on, on the way to work in Leeds. And he said to me, Leslie, um, would you like to do a production of Francesca de Rimini? And I'd heard of the story because it's a romantic story from Dante's Inferno, and I loved it as a teenager about this girl who's forced into a loveless marriage and in the end elopes with the man she loves and is killed for doing that. It's very romantic. And I said, I'd love to, David. And he said, ask me where it is. And I said, where, where is it? And with glee, he told me it was at the Scala. So, of course, I said yes. The... Opera, which was written in 2018 by Ricardo Zantanay, is based on a play by an extraordinary poet, um, a, an Italian poet called Gabriele D'Annunzio. He was around at the beginning of the 20th century. He was as famous as someone as W.B. Yeats here. Um, he wrote extensive work. He was interested in politics. He was an aesthete. He lived this incredible life. He built a house for himself on the lake at Garda, which is almost like a museum to his existence. He was a hedonist, and he had nationalist political views. Described by the New York Times as the sex-crazed poet-statesman who briefly built an empire. He was an incredibly flamboyant writer, and he was a, an Italian war hero in the First World War. Indeed, he flew a biplane over the city of Vienna, and that's without a license, and dropped his poetry containing Italian propaganda, which apparently caused the Austro-Hungarian army to retreat. He lived by the maxim, you should live your life as if it's a work of art. By 1914, he was one of Italy's greatest living writers. His private life was notorious. He spent beyond his means. He was an av avid collector of art, of horses, and a user of cocaine. He left his family destitute, and with mo he had more than 100 affairs. He even notified the press of an impending breakup so they could give it as wide coverage as possible. Denuncio had insisted at the premiere there should be real cannons that fired real shot and that there should be real fire. On that evening, the cannons fired and blew a wall off the theatre. And the smoke from the fire was so strong that the audience were nearly asphyxiated. In true Italian fashion, the play was an enormous success. Later on in 1914, the Italian composer Riccardo Zandani decided to base an opera on D'Annunzio's work, and therefore we have the title of the opera, Francesca de Rimini. 
The piece premiered at the theatre in Turin and again was an incredible success. Uh, David and I did something I like to do, which is to take a trip to the, a place that has a resonance within the work. And we were fortunate to be able to make a trip to Denuncio's house, which is on the shores of Lake Garda. It's still intact. It's a museum to him. And in his own lifetime, it was an, actually a, muse a museum to himself. He was a great, as I said, he was a great collector of objects. So the house is stuffed with imagery. He wor worked in a room, in the centre of the room, where there were objects absolutely everywhere, from busts to freezers to Egyptian figures, you name it. Some of it beautiful works of art, other bits were just junk. In his garden, he had a battleship which was carved into the landscape where he would receive guests. The lines of the garden were modern and quite brutal, but the setting is undeniably beautiful. At the end of the day of, of taking in this house, Dave and I sat down on the amphitheatre that overlooks that incredible lake, that steely blue water with the mountains beyond. David said, you need to make me a war machine. I don't know how you do that, but something that tells us the story in a surprising way. The, the story is based on a story by Dante from the Inferno about a young girl who's forced into a loveless marriage um, and then falls in love with the brother of the man she's married, who's also married. It's very telling, this story. And they sort of become lovers. Um, her husband, who she doesn't love, catches them both and, and kills them both. And that's the end of the story. And we sat there sort of thinking of different ways of, of presenting this on stage at La Scala. Imagine someone puts a cannon through the steps and suddenly another world starts to invade this beautiful space. And that was, that hit me and I thought, this is a really good premise for starting work. So I thought, I need to capture images of this space and take them back to my studio. And, and I was very excited at this point because I thought, I felt we had a really strong beginning. And I thought, actually, having spent the day in Denuncio's world and having thought about it a lot before, I thought, in a way, Francesca's the story of his life. You know, this man who loved aesthetics and beauty uh, and also the sort of noble nature of being a warrior, of a man of the military, and found no difficulty having those very opposite sides of himself and exploring them. Indeed, this was the man who said one should live one's life as art. I got back to the studio and, and started work. This is a painting by Alexander Cabanel from 1870, and it's very romantic, the depiction of the two lovers, Francesca and Paolo, united together in death, in this beautiful romantic interior with exotic clothing of class, of, of, of romance, the romantic idea of death. And then I started looking at the work of uh, Sir Lawrence Alma Tedema, who's a, a British painter who was around at the same time as the story was written. And we think of him now as a pre-Raphaelite. He painted these incredible pictures uh, of, of Arcadian scenes, of a place where time almost doesn't exist, of, of leisure, of pleasure, of music, of, of beauty, of m translucent marble, of places to sit and to languor of uh, water with distant horizons. And I just thought, actually, if you look at them in this picture of his in, in context, you think in that period of time, somewhere over that horizon, there was a battleship approaching and the world was changing. We're on the brink of the First World War. I looked at sculpture as well, especially sort of memorial sculpture of figurative sculpture ca caught within a kind of architecture that remembers war and the nature of war. This is an incredible uh, memorial which is in London and it's by Charles Sargent Jagger who's an incredible sculptor. And what's really interesting about it, um, the figures who are in bronze are, are very striking but at the top of the sculpture is a piece of military ordnance. Um, it's a 9.2 inch 
how it's uh, carved out of stone. It sort of unites it with this idea of this plinth. And uh, that felt interesting and sort of, again, going back to the Tedema, you can see there's a kind of a world of plinths and figures. And sort of that suggests to me how these two different worlds, a world of war and the world of aesthetics and beauty could be brought together. And then I looked at imagery from the First World War itself and I thought, and you know, I talked to David about actually, in a one way we want to keep the idea of this kind of medieval world of fabric in the costume designer, Marie-Jean Lecker, um, was very good at sort of making very beautiful costume and sort of not to, to have that context as well to express the aesthetic and the, the, the medieval idea was really very useful for doing that. But then to combine it with a world that almost looks almost as ancient, the world of the First World War, of that machinery, of it's almost clockwork, it's covered in oil, it's covered in mud. You see men in rough uniforms working these machines, um, getting them over difficult terrain. And suddenly I thought, actually, it's, the ideas started to coalesce. So I sort of started sketching out ideas. And, and what happened very quickly, I thought, um, I want to create something that is all there from the, from the beginning, that we see this very Arcadian world, but then it's also encased in another story. Dramatically, we start off in an art class, um, and that was David's idea, to give it an, an extra sense of the aesthetic, that not only did they live in this very sort of pure, clean, fragile, eggshell, marble space, but their, their gaze and their lives were about the pursuit of art. And gradually, gradually, somehow we would enclose that and destroy that by the other world, the, the world that Francesca moves to, the world of Giovanni, her husband, and the military, the military might of his landscape. When I'm designing, I like to play with ideas and because what I'm going to do eventually will end up on stage much bigger, I will make a representation of that. I'll start right at the beginning and I'll do sketches, but then I very quickly move into three-dimensional models which are to scale. So I work in a scale which is called 1 to 25, so figures are about this big, um, and I always work with the human figure in the model because that's the story I'm telling and that's what I'm doing and what I'm assisting with visually. So these are sketches of, of, of the idea as it developed and I'm trying different things out. So I'm, I'm looking at what if this is a marble space with a, a large bas relief figure against the wall who's a languorous figure that emphasises where we begin the piece. On this plinth where it gives a focus into the centre of the stage. And I love the idea in that vast auditorium, uh, I, I love the idea on that vast stage at La Scala that I would create a sculptural element that only referred to itself and sat there elegantly and beautifully in the, in the darkness, that people would vanish within its structure and, and arrive from its structure, but never from the wings. So it was a, it, it was a kind of contained world. So that was, very key to the design from the beginning. And then I developed the idea of staircases on the outer structure. So, and here I am sort of playing with the idea of a forest of spears that sort of almost Francesca gets lost in and sort of very brave ideas. And then I took them to the Scala and we sort of, it was sort of roughly agreed that I should continue and, and, and I developed the work further. At some point, I have to get very specific about what I'm doing, but always referring back to the references that are important. As I said, the idea of a structure that comes from the First World War, but that is also medieval. And I thought, actually, in a way, the whole space takes a single journey. What if this space, which starts off like it's a room of beauty of young people, you know, and in a way, I saw my young self in that space at an art class, pursuing happiness and love and, and art. And then suddenly that whole space, through the action of it having to change, becomes almost like a World War I gone turret. So actually, the, 
bones of the end of the piece is contained right at the beginning of the design. You just don't see it from the start. And then, as I said, I sort of created a sort of bas relief idea of, of Francesca there in the space. Why have Francesca on stage um, as a person and then a representation of her in sculpture? And I thought, well, aesthetically, that period relies and needs figurative sculpture. You know, there were great pieces of art made at that time, but I, I also thought, in a way, it's the inner voice of Francesca, almost that sculpture, when making it such a big scale, was this sort of puppeteer of the changes in the space and who would deliver the story. So in scale, I started carving elements of this sculpture, what it could look like, and started off with, with hands and how maybe the hands could refer to different parts of the story. And this is a the sculpture in the studio, which is quite small at that point, but which would become quite big. And this is a sort of developed figure. I love the idea of the figure not being, you know, very emotional, not being obviously angry or obviously sad, that the, the emotions in it are sort of ambiguous, where she could almost be protective or she could almost be destructive, but there's no emotional context that's displayed obviously in her, in her gesture and her face and to me that is also so powerful. So as the design developed uh, it became more finished. So here is a representation of the opening space. As you can see this marble interior with its plinth and its huge scale figure almost like she sat in the bath and with her hand on the edge of the bath and just one finger touching a step. So it's very active. She could move at any moment. She's looking down to the center of the space. So she's watching, always watching what's going on. That allowed us to sort of um, refer to that and to give the center of the space a kind of power. As the story developed in Act One, you can see the space just slightly starts to open. Remember back to that lake, that lake which is Lake Garda, that silvery lake that David and I sat and looked at, and there it is, that idea of, of water. The idea of an opening suddenly also suggests things are changing. When we have an opening set, it suggests someone is going to come through it, and indeed, Francesca's world was going to change forever. Once David and I had got to an idea that we felt was the final idea. It was time to take the idea to Milan itself. After presenting it to the artistic management and for the work to be accepted, the next part of the process is to go to the incredible workshops at La Scala, somewhere I had always wanted to go and had only ever seen in pictures. The workshops were the sets, the props, the costume, you name it, the rehearsals happen, is not in the same building, it's not in the theatre, it's in another part of the city. It's a place called the Ansaldo. It's an old train building workshop. It's these huge industrial buildings, all interconnected, that contain everything. They're like cathedrals to craft. Um, and you can see in this picture is, is where uh, sets are taken apart and built and painted and then this is the painting floor, which is next door. It's the most incredible space. Slightly intimidating to walk in the first time. Um, obviously, what I do is very collaborative, and I work with an incredible team at La Scala. You can see in this picture, um, this is from a visit later on in the process when the work had actually started on building the set, and we're inspecting everything in detail. I'm there checking we're going to get what we want, but it's going to work in the right way. And I work with an incredible production manager there. Uh, there she is, just slightly out of the picture, and you can't quite see her face, but her name's Emanuela Fernardi. And she took me through the whole process um, and walked me through working in that incredible building. But there we are on a day looking at those elements in which, which I made small in the studio with my assistant. And there you go, there's the hand again. 
and now it's an extraordinary scale. I know La Scala are really good at sculpting. Everybody had told me that, so I had no hesitation in, in having quite a, a big sculptural element within the set. And it was a great joy to go there that day and see, there you go, there's the hand again. And that sort of, the detail of it, it's great craft to actually give it that sort of poise and, and balance. And there you go, there's the head of the figure in process. You can see some of it still just very simple polystyrene blocks. But through a system of creating miniatures and slicing them up and analysing the sculpture, they built a pretty brilliant representation of the model. As well as the set being built, also the props for the show are being made too. So a little walk through the building is the props department. Again, I always think of the Scala and I think of horses. I have so many brilliant productions that, that have sculptural horses. It just seems to be endless there. And actually it was quite exciting to create a horse for this production. As you can see, it's a, it's a gold horse. It lives uh, aesthetically somewhere between a medieval armoured horse and also a horse from the First World War. Um, this would be the horse that we would see the first appearance of Paolo, the love of Francesca's life. He would be pushed by soldiers in gold costume. Paolo would be on the horse, dressed in armour, looking resplendent. Everything is gold and everything is silver. The, I, the, the romantic idea of love as the day drew to a close and I was leaving, I just remember turning back and just seeing all the set together, as yet unfinished, but getting a real feel of what it was to become. You can see that the sculpture now is really alive and sort of the head has been placed on top of the shoulders, but around it is this black space which is sort of enveloping it. And again, it's sort of reassuring that the ideas that David and I had worked on so um, many months ago were starting to sort of exist in, the real, in real life. Later on another visit, uh, we're very close to the set leaving the workshop and that sort of very anxious moment and very important and inevitable moment of the set going to the theatre. I love this picture because, uh, you know, at that point I'd spent nearly two years of my life with that image in my in my mind and, and, and as part of me. But there she is, almost sort of poised, ready to go on the next part of her adventure. That wonderful veil made, made um, from bubble wrap and that class made from a piece of tape just tells a sort of lovely story of where we are in time in, in making the production. As well as the set happening, one thing I mustn't forget to talk about is the fact that rehearsals also in another part of this incredible complex of buildings is happening. You can see here a very simple markup on the floor that represents the, you know, the, the structure, the plinth. And you can see it's the beginning of the piece because there are easels. Uh, some of the cast are wearing rehearsal skirts. That gives them a feeling of, of what they will be wearing in the show. As you can see, there's a man watching. He was the man who was in the early photograph. That's David, the director. Checking, he's getting everything right. People are doing what needs to happen. There's a choreographer, Denny Sayer, who was working on the show. She's looking on as well. Um, it's an exciting room to walk in because I know what the space will become. I'm checking that what they're doing in the space will work on the space that I've created. The great thing about having rehearsals and the set being built in the same building is that the director can walk and see things being built. There are no surprises when you get on stage uh, for him. Oh, where is the door at the back? There isn't one. Those moments don't happen. Towards the end of the rehearsals, I went for a meeting in the theatre and finally I got to walk out on the stage at La Scala. Well, as I said when I was 18, that was my life's ambition and uh, that was an incredible feeling because it is an extraordinary beautiful space and just to have a moment just to look at it and really importantly to imagine what the set is going to look like in that space how it will work i'll walk around the, the stage amazingly the, the uh, luciano who's the head of the props there sort of took me to a specific spot and said this is the place where maria callas would love to sing and i stood there and 
I didn't sing, I clapped my hands just to check the acoustic. But then I walked around what I guess was the footprint of the set and just tried to imagine what it would feel like in that space. I stood at the back and clapped my hands and wondered what the acoustic would be like and just imagine the journey ahead. Over the next few weeks, bit by bit as rehearsals moved to the theatre, we started to build the set on stage. That's a very exciting moment because we start to bring all the different elements together. The performers, all the work that they've done now exists on the real theatrical space. All the props come into the show, the costumes come into the show, we start to light it, which is incredibly detailed. What I love about opera is you think of the hundreds and hundreds of people involved on an evening to bring it together. And uh, something I always do um, on the first night is I, I don't generally watch, I generally sit backstage and watch the machine of the opera, everything we've asked for, how it's executed, the people who have to make calls, the people who have to run in, up and down the wings, deliver uh, scenery and props to the stage, the performers, where they go, where they have to get off, where they get changed, watching this incredible endeavour that nobody would know about because on stage it looks like it's effortless but people work incredibly hard to do that. So it's a very exciting thing to sort of finally witness how that works. Um, and also it's a good way of dealing with theatrical nerves. Um, and there you go. This is the opening scene of the show. As you can see, the figure is now lit. Uh, the performers are now costumed. Um, we're in an art class. It's sort of beautifully, the costumes are beautifully colored by Marie-Jean Lecker. Um, where you see Francesca all dressed in white. She's, she's youthful, innocent and, and happy. Um, there again we go and we see finally the horse all finished, pushed by these medieval World War I soldiers in gold heavy coats. And there's Paolo in his gold resplendent mirror-like armour. The music at this point is, there's no singing. It's, 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 it's a section of very romantic music. It can't help but open your heart. And somehow, the, with David choreographing this horse moving very slowly, the image, and, and this young girl stood at the centre of the set. You can see the sculpture is looking down at her smaller self. It just, it worked. Then, as the story developed, and suddenly Francesca is taken away from this world, and she now has to marry Giovanni. Well. What I didn't want to do is have something where this set has to go and, and we have to bring on another set. Actually, everything happened. All the scene changes were live and suddenly she was enveloped by this new world. We saw her put on a military coat which was heavy over her shoulders, over her white linen dress. As you can see, there were spears piercing through the wall. There was this dirty machinery which is beginning to be lit, which is on the outside of this marble, this pure space. Now soldiers in their dark clothes of heavy wools and leather invading the space. It's all very sudden. There is no going back. Suddenly this structure completes and we see another kind of sculpture a one, a one of cannons of soldiers. My reference is also like sort of old fashioned military ships of submarines, some are really intense of a very sort of male environment. And then putting this young girl who has to find her way through this structure up these staircases, lost like a labyrinth, um, something inescapable, no way out. Um, to sort of focus on her story then in this space with all these men and these cannons was incredibly powerful. As you can see, the shield, which was the emblem for the family, has lowered and become a platform. So the performers can stand over the edge of the precipice, almost over the pit of La Scala. Now, the, the cannons are an important reference because remember I said about the original production where there were, there were cannons and they actually fired. And I thought, I actually... I want to reference that because it feels right for this element of this sculptural form. And actually, now the chorus, the male chorus, can wind them down and you can't have that many cannons at, at La Scala and there were about 30. They have to fire. We have to do this. 
And I thought, actually, when I listened to the music with David, it was long. And I thought, this single action of this winding these cannons down, that's not enough. We have to do something else. So, as I said about the gun turret, and I thought, I want to do, I'd like to do the biggest ca cannon La Scala has ever seen. So I thought, wouldn't it be wonderful if, if the idea just went further and the structure opened and we realised this whole set was a machine of war that David had asked me to make. And not only would we see this, like the horse, another metallic object, very splendid, you know, this is sort of covered in aluminium foil, so uh, it looks heavy but almost dew-like. And then it lowered down over the orchestra, and I thought, how wonderful, we should fire this thing at the audience. <laughs> um, and indeed we did. Um, it was wonderful actually um, watching that moment from the side because actually in a way you see your work in a different way, and it almost had a sort of a reality to it all. All the references I'd looked at over and over again suddenly were there and important and, and valid. There is an image of a plane. Now, this plane is a plane that's very famous because it was Denuncio's plane. Indeed, he had flown it over Vienna and dropped propaganda um, in the form of poetry as I mentioned before. Um, I wanted to have an image in the second part of the piece that suggested war was going on. I didn't want something quite literal and I thought actually taking that plane from the house, bring it into our world, making it sort of metalized and sort of 1910s, you know, sort of glamorous and sh with a soft sheen. Now you can see that the space is, is filled with spears. Um, the, the women who had been in the art class at the beginning were now wearing costumes, sort of military costumes. There's a table with phones and lamps. They're carrying out orders. There's a desk where a general is sat. So suddenly, the world has become all about war. You can see a hand has moved as well. One is holding the plane. I like to think She's either protecting it or she's destroying it. The other hand is holding a book. The book is the bed that Francesca sleeps in. This world is traumatic for her. Her escape is her imagination. She reads stories of Tristan and I saw romantic medieval stories of love and lives within those, waiting for Paolo, her, her lover, to return. I love the idea of that when she reads, she turns over the the pages of the book, which are also her bed, which is filled with illuminated medieval stories. It just helps tell the point of where she is emotionally. I love this image um, because it has the two worlds. We see the sculpture, who's now sort of covered in a light, which has come through the set uh, and hits her and sort of breaks up the image. It's almost like, to me, it feels like pouring engine oil. There's something really ugly and brutal about that, but also in a strange way quite beautiful. You can see Giovanni up on the structure telling us where, how, where he is and he's searching for Francesca. I love this image of the sculpture in the space with the structure, the metal structure that surrounds it, sort of almost enveloping it. You remember the picture in the workshop where I was imagining a moment like this. But then what we see with the light, um, that the light through the structure pours these incredible shadows over, over the sculpture. And to me, they look like sort of engine oil. There's something quite brutal. It became actually the idea for the poster. As we made the renderings for this, someone in the production department said, oh, could we use them and, 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 uh, for the poster, which was quite thrilling. But, um, and also that's something I really love is where the images of the show are very much about the experience that people are going to see. But I love this image. You see, the, see Giovanni up on the structure. He's almost just slightly off center stage, right in the middle, but not quite. He's completely isolated up there. The world around him looks ferocious and angry, um, hostile. 
you feel we're close at that point in the story to the moment where Paolo and Francesca cannot contain their love anymore and have to make love. Um, at that point, a spear descends from the flies, a golden spear, and, uh, and ends their lives. And that was our show at La Scala, Francesca de Rimini. I mean, it was quite an amazing night, the opening night. Um, La Scala, the audience, have a terrifying reputation. Generally, they will boo you, and I know all about that because I have experienced that once, but on this, they were quiet and the applause was incredible. It was probably one of the best nights of my life uh, to have worked there. Um, anyway, it's been absolutely wonderful to share this adventure with you and actually to, to remember it again and how making a piece of work, how that begins and the journey one goes through to that point where you have to let go of it, that opening night moment. I sort of love and dread it at the same time. But um, uh, thank you and um, all the best. If there are any questions, please contact the Art Centre and I'm more than happy to answer them and talk further with any of you if you'd like to do so. But for the time being, stay well. Thank you.